Well, there's many things I'm grateful for. My grandchildren, they're the ones who keep me happy and going. My family, my classmates, and my school. Good food, you know, good steak. Definitely God and my family. I'm grateful for my family and my church. Just having dinner with my wife. When you look back in your life, the conversations you have at the dinner table are something that are really gonna mean a lot to you. I definitely haven't told my brother that I'm grateful for him because sometimes he can be a real big pain, but I do love him so much. He's always there and I really appreciate that. Uh, waking up next to my beautiful bride. Finding a church community that I can really connect with. My children. <laughs> my family always has my back no matter what. I'm grateful that God forgives us for all the things that we've done wrong and he takes our messes and he's able to make it better than it was before. I'm grateful the way he brought my family together. And I'm gonna get emotional so I can. <laughs> I'm even happy to be alive since I just came out of the hospital with a blood clot in my lung and here I am. So I get to go outside every day and breathe this fresh air that calms me and gives me peace when I'm feeling anxious. I am grateful for everything I have and I will always be grateful. Gratitude changes everything. Grateful, grateful. We're talking about being grateful or becoming more grateful. Uh, if you were with us last week, you know we're in the second part of the series all about gratitude, gratitude. When we say gratitude, what we're talking about is seeing the good in life, like recognizing the good in life. If you were with us last week, you know we talked about all these benefits of gratitude, how it's amazing, it's amazing how simply being grateful can change what's going on inside your body it can affect things like your blood pressure. It's good for your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health, your spiritual health. It improves relationships. It makes people more resilient. It actually helps people to make better decisions. The benefits of gratitude are just crazy. It's just crazy. And so the question we we're asking is like, well, well, why aren't we more grateful then? You know, why don't we all just do it? Uh, so a couple years ago, I uh, had the opportunity to take some flight lessons in uh, a Cessna, like a little single en engine plane. I actually wasn't flying the plane. I was in the back of the plane. A friend of mine, someone who's on the team, his name's Steven, he's a pilot. And as he was taking lessons, he gave me the chance to ride in the plane with him and his instructor. And so I would sit in the back of this like tiny little plane. It was fun. It was fun. I did it like, I don't know, five or six times, but I would watch him. And I'm a little bit older than him, so I'd watch the way he was flying the plane, you know, what he's holding on to and pressing the buttons. And I'm like, yeah, I could do that, you know. I think I could drive a car. He couldn't even drive a car, I don't think, at that point, but I could. So I'm like, I could fly a plane. How hard could it be, right? Uh, and so I'm just kind of watching for, for like weeks, several different times. And eventually I go up this one time. It was right about the time of my birthday. And we land in Bridgeport, Connecticut, about halfway through the lesson. And the instructor comes out and he's like, Stephen's parents have paid for a lesson for you to fly back. And so now it's my turn to fly the plane. And I was like, great. You know, now everyone will have a chance to see how quickly I pick this up. And so I get in the plane and very, very quickly, I realized this was a lot harder than I thought. You drive with your feet, you turn with your feet. There's a zillion buttons, there's things you gotta pull and the steering wheel comes out, not for adjustment, but to go like up and down. And it was just like extremely difficult. We get in the air, all right? And fortunately, the guy, the instructor also has a yoke. He can fly the plane from his seat, otherwise we'd be dead. Uh, but we're in the air and I'm doing this. Like we look like a dolphin. We're going up and down. You think it's easy to just like sail. It's not. And so we're sitting there and the instructor is really nice guy, but you know, like pretty firm in his direction. And he looks at me and he's like, flatten it out. And I was like, uh, okay. You know, and we're still going like this. And he's like, flatten it out. I'm like, okay. You know, and, and he's like starting to get excited. He's like, flatten it out. And he keeps saying it like louder and louder. And eventually I get to the point where I like look at him like, yeah, loud and clear. Like I get that, you know, I, that is the goal. I understand. <clears throat> 
but we need to move from like the instruction to like the how, you know? Like maybe you tell me, is there a button to push that flattens this thing out? Is there something I don't know here? And I just remember feeling like I couldn't make it happen, you know? And, and as I'm thinking about gratitude, like for me, really, it's kind of like that same thing, you know? I've heard, be grateful, be grateful, be grateful, be grateful. And I'm kind of feeling like, you know, you read it on your napkins, you see it on the wall, it's everywhere, be grateful. It's like, yeah, okay, message received. I get, I'm not trying to be an ungrateful jerk. I just like can't put it into practice as easy as I'd like to. And so last week and this week, we're talking about like how, like are there things we can do, areas we can focus on that will allow us to be more grateful. We talked about this idea of awareness, awareness. Like simply, this was last week, it's like, like understanding the beliefs beneath the surface. Like what you believe that maybe you don't articulate. And the example we used was a little boy who you offer broccoli to, right? You can teach that boy that he should be grateful and he can learn to say thank you without ever experiencing real feelings of gratitude there. And so what's the problem? The problem is really there's a belief beneath the surface that can conflicts with the idea of being grateful. Now, if you can address that belief, the problem is the, belief belie- the boy believes that it's useless. But if you can address that belief and speak to it and explain to him like, hey, if you ever wanna play in the NBA, you know, you gotta be 6'5", and this broccoli's gonna get you there. All of a sudden, though that's not true, like all of a sudden, you may, you may actually change the way he feels about that broccoli. It may actually change his feelings of gratitude. But it happens only when we address the beliefs beneath the surface. What we said is your beliefs beneath the surface, they have the ability to amplify or undermine your ability to feel grateful. And by extension, on the largest level, when we talk about worldview or your understanding of God and who God is, we said your beliefs about God specifically will amplify or undermine your ability to feel grateful. If you really believe there's a God who's in your corner or you're at least open to that idea, it will like give you the ability or at least point you in the direction of feeling more grateful. But if you feel like the whole world is out to get you and nothing ever goes your way, it will undermine your ability to see the good in situations. So it starts with being aware, like addressing. If I don't feel grateful toward this person, well, what do I actually believe? Am I just trying to muster out some gratitude, muster up some gratitude? Maybe there's a belief beneath the surface that needs to be addressed. And so this week we're talking, we're gonna look at a passage. Uh, it's one of my like favorite passages. It's a passage that's pretty well known. We've talked about it here before, but it is essential to understanding gratitude. And what I love so much about it is that it is literally centuries ahead of its time. The things that the apostle Paul is writing like literally over a thousand years ago, we are learning about mental and emotional health today. And so this is one of those passages where whether you're totally bought into the whole church thing or you're still like, no, I'm not sure and I like really don't want to be here anyway. Like this is one of those things where if you put it into practice, no matter what you believe, it may build some credibility with the whole idea of who Jesus is and what, he's ta- what he taught and what his followers taught. It's essential to understanding gratitude. And so there's, there's this letter that someone named Paul writes. Now, Paul was a follower of Jesus. He was so excited about who Jesus was and what Jesus taught that he went around starting brand new churches. And his life was rough. He was often like arrested. He faced a lot of hardship. He traveled a lot and traveling, like life on the road was not easy back in the ancient world. He didn't have a nice tour bus. Like things were tough. He was constantly subject to danger and eventually finds himself in prison. And so he decides he's going to write th- to these churches instead of visiting them because his, he's limited with what he can do. And he writes a letter to a church in Philippi. And in that letter, he updates them. Like he tells them all about what he's doing. He says some pretty profound things. And then he kind of wraps things, wraps things up. And he talks about how we see the world. He talks about what goes on emotionally. He talks about joy. He tells them to rejoice in the Lord always. Like try to anchor your joy 
in the things about God that bring you joy. The whole idea that God is in your corner, that he cares for you, that he pursues you, that he's interested in you. Like anchor your joy in that in spite of your circumstances. He tells them that they should pray like with all kinds of prayers. He says prayers and petitions with grateful prayers. Make your requests known to God. He says, and like God's peace will be with you. It'll guard your heart and your mind. It's like a pretty popular passage. If you're familiar with his letter, you might've heard that before. And then he wraps things up and here's what he says. He says, finally, finally, brothers and sisters, he's speaking to people in his community of faith. He says, finally, whatever is true, like right and true, whatever is noble, whatever is right and whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, he says, whatever is admirable, like all these good things, the things in life that you're attracted to, the things in life that bring you joy, the good things in life. He doesn't say desire these things. He doesn't say pursue these things. He doesn't say work for these things. His final instructions, he says, think if, he says, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. His idea here is think about what you think about. Pay attention to the things that you're paying attention to. Find the good in life and keep it in the front of your mind. He's telling them to be intentional. If last week we were talking about awareness, like being aware of what we actually believe beneath the surface, sometimes we need to go deep and we need to address the things that we believe about things. But then there are other things that are good right in front of us that we're simply not seeing because we're not intentionally seeing the good all around us. This is the idea of gratitude. Like simply recognizing the good that's there and savoring it, finding joy, satisfaction in it, seeing it. And these are the instructions he leaves with them. Now I'm gonna show you a picture uh, and I just want you to take like a mental snapshot of it, all right? Just like for three seconds, I'll show you this picture. You ready? Ready? Okay, here we go. Throw it up there. Three seconds. Two, one, take it away. All right, now, on the count of three, I want you to call out what you saw really loud. Ready? One, two, three. There's a little deliberation. All right, put it back up there. Okay, so it's a picture of a tree. But if you look carefully, there's also a lion or some kind of large cat. And there's a gorilla over here. There's also some fish on the bottom, right? Okay. Now, in case, in case you can't tell, uh, two people can look at the same thing and see totally different things. Nick, we can take that down. Two people can look at the same thing and see different things. Two people can look at the same circumstance and see different things. Two people can look at the same person or the same relationship or the same action and see different things. One person can see the struggle, the misfortune, and the difficulty, and someone else can see the good in the situation. Now, there's, uh, there are other optical illusions like this. Like there's this one where maybe you've seen it, there's a picture of an old lady and a girl. It's like from one angle, it's an old lady, from another angle, it's a girl. And it's way more like this or that. You know, people tend to see one or the other naturally, right? For this one, 
it's like everybody pretty much sees the tree, you know? And you have to look a little harder to see the gorilla and the lion and the fish. And so I picked that because when it comes to discomfort and misfortune in our lives, like those are the things we're hardwired to experience, like for pain to capture our attention, right? Like that's the point of pain, it's to get your attention. And so if something difficult happens to you or unfortunate, it's going to capture your attention. It's gonna be the tree that jumps out in front of you. But there are some of us that tend to be better at recognizing the gorilla in the trees, the good in the difficulty than others. And like anything else, believe it or not, this actually comes with practice. Uh, In January, if you were with us, we did a whole series called Broken Patterns. It was about breaking certain patterns of thinking. And in that series, we talked about something called the Tetris effect. The Tetris effect comes from this, uh, this project, this research project, where they took all these people, they put them in a room, they had them play Tetris for hours. If you don't know, it's the like game, it's been on cell phones, Game Boys, whatever. It's like the shapes coming down, you fit them into the spots, with that awesome music. And what they found is that when people play that game for long enough, you actually leave and you start to see shapes in real life. You start to recognize how like, oh, I, I think like two of those chairs could fit right there in that gap. And I think like the cereal box there could probably fit right over there. And you start to like measure, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. In fact, just this past week, I was talking to a friend of mine just randomly in conversation. He's like, yeah, sometimes I have trouble sleeping. I'm an accountant. I deal with numbers all day. He's like, when I go to bed, I see numbers when I close my eyes. And I was like, there's a name for that. It's called the Tetris effect. He was like, I don't care what the heck it's called. I want to go to sleep. (laughs) But the idea is that What we see intentionally, we eventually see automatically. And so if you want to see the good in your life, in the things around you, you have to be intentional about it. It's why things like gratitude practices, like going to bed at night and just writing down a few things you're grateful for can be so Good, so healthy. I've got this little app on my phone. It alerted me one day, like a little while ago. It was like, hey, it's almost bedtime. Why don't you sit down and do like a meditation? And normally I get that. I'm like, nope, I don't have time for that. I got things to worry about. And so, but this time, for whatever reason, I was like, okay, fine. Put in my headphones. I like laid down, like started to breathe. And there's really like calm lady in the background and, you know, the music. and, And she's like, think about some of the highlights of your day. What was a moment where you felt alive? And I stopped and I like, thought about a conversation I had with my wife. I thought about an interaction I had with my daughter, like something I did with my son. So I just take a moment to like, savor those things. And just sitting there, I was like uplifted. Not because anything changed, but because I took a moment to see the good around me. And so what we see and look for intentionally, we eventually see automatically, and you know this, there are people in your life that are so good at seeing the good, and there are people in your life that tend to always see the bad. You know it, they probably don't realize it, but they're seeing it automatically. It's not because they're trying. So in this passage, Paul's actually not done. He's not done. And this is part, part that I think is like pretty cool. He, he says, he goes on, he says, think about such things. And then he says, okay, so he's talking to people he loves, his friends. He says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, or he's got like one more thing, or, or seen in me, he says, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Now I read that, right? And if I'm just reading it like leisurely, I just keep going. But if I'm reading it to like actually do this stuff, I'm like, all right, Paul, what I've learned, received, or heard from you. All right, well, we've got some letters I can like learn and receive and hear. You know, someone can read it to me and I can try to put that into practice. But this little extra thing you throw in there, like, or seen in me, well, I don't know what to do with that because I don't even know what he looks like. I couldn't pick him out of a lineup. I didn't live my life with him in it, right? And so it's like, what do we do with that there? Well, 
what's kind of neat, and what we, like, at least if you're like me, like, often don't do, is not only look at what he's saying, but in the way that he's saying it. In other words, like, not only learn from his explanation, but also from his example. And if you rewind a little bit and go to the beginning of this letter, he's updating his friends, people that he loves, people that he calls his brothers and sisters, and explains to them what's going on in his life. And in that, you get to see how he sees things. Now, in case like you don't remember from a couple of minutes ago, I told you Paul was in prison. He's writing this from a Roman prison where he's being like treated horribly. He probably stinks. He's denied food on a regular basis. Like he's being given just enough to survive. The people around him were not kind to him. Like his life was incredibly difficult. Not only that, but while he's in there, there are people going around who claim to be teachers about Jesus, people who are claiming to be Jesus followers who are teaching and they're trashing him. Like they are intentionally destroying his reputation while he's in prison and they're out there. So he's stuck. His reputation is being ruined. His credibility is being questioned. He doesn't know what his life's gonna look like. Literally any day someone could walk into his room and be like, today's the day you die. And that's it. He's living in intense uncertainty And so in updating them, I don't know if you're writing letters in prison to your friends, but if I am, I've got nothing good to say in this letter, right? And here's what he says to start out the letter, okay? Here's what we learned from his example. He says, "Now, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, what has happened to me, like being in prison, all this stuff, what has happened to me? It has actually served to advance the gospel, the good news about Jesus, this story that I've devoted my life to, he's saying. And he goes on and he says, as a result of me being here in prison, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ, like for Jesus, that this is like, he is worth this to me. And he says, and because of my chains, these metal things shackled around me. He says, most of the brothers and sisters have become more confident in the Lord. Like their faith has increased and they dare all the more to proclaim the gospel, the good news about Jesus without fear. Like that's how he's seeing his imprisonment. He's like, okay, well, okay, let's talk about those imposters, right? Those people that are trying to destroy my reputation. He's like, okay, fine. Well, it's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. He says, the, the latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel, that I'm put here because I'm trying to do something good. But the former preach Christ out of Selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble, trouble for me while I'm in chains. The people that are trying to ruin my reputation. So what does he say? I'd be like, go get them. He writes, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. People are learning about how good God is. And because of this, he says, I rejoice. Like what I love about this guy is that he doesn't just teach it, he like lives it. His, he is not saying, I like being here. He's not saying this is a good thing. In fact, he often says his life was really difficult, but he is relentlessly digging for the good in it, and he is fixing his mind on that. Like relentlessly pursuing and seeing the good all around him. And so he says, in, in that I rejoice. What we look for intentionally, we eventually see automatically. And, and this is what it looks like.
for me, like part of this whole idea that is like so powerful is the idea of how, how bad the alternative is. Like what happens when we don't intentionally see the good around us? Uh, I read a book recently, I actually read it a few times, called The Happiness Advantage. It's by a guy named Sean Acor. He talks about like what makes people happy and what we're learning about the brain and the mind in terms of gratitude, happiness, all that stuff. And he talks about uh, like what we have uh, in our minds, in our brains. He, he calls it a spam folder. Now, if you know what a spam folder is, if you have email, it's this like part of your email, it's an algorithm that picks up mail, like emails, that your email client has come to believe that you don't want to see. And so it automatically puts it in the junk folder. You don't even know that it came in unless you check your spam folder because it's been sent there automatically. And he said, what we do, it's something called selective attention. Our minds do the same exact thing. In other words, when something's happening in front of us and we're not intentional about looking for it, our brain just sends it to spam. And it doesn't even register consciously. In other words, what we fail to see intentionally, we often miss, we tend to miss completely. If you don't believe me, the, the lights behind me, are, they're now pink. But they actually didn't start that way. When we started the service, the lights were orange. Let's put them back to what they were. They were orange, right? It wasn't some like dramatic change, right? But most of us weren't sitting there like looking for the lights to change. And even though it's literally right in front of you, if you're facing this way, you've been watching that the whole time, but your brain has just sent it to spam. It's sent to spam. And so if we're not intentionally looking for the good in our lives, it, we just don't see it. It never registers, and it will erode the quality of our lives, it will erode the quality of our circumstances, how we experience the good things in life, it will erode the quality of our relationships if we're not intentionally looking for it. I, a few years ago, I spent some time in uh, a third world country. There's a lot of poverty, and because of that, human trafficking was a really big thing. I went down there to get to know this organization that tries to take girls out of the trafficking industry. Like young girls, tries to save them from it, teach them something that they can do so they don't have to go into that industry to help provide for their families. And while I was there, I had the chance to meet some of them. I saw how their parents would like chase after the garbage truck on its way into the dump to pull out anything they could salvage. It's like the whole experience was just heartbreaking. At one point we went into a home in the village, this tiny little shack, and I met a little girl, I had a conversation with her and I joked around with her at the time, she was about the age of my daughter. And when we left, I was told that unless something changes in that girl's home situation, it's very likely she's gonna enter the trafficking industry sometimes with the consent of her parents. And it would like just tore me up, especially because of how old my own daughter was. And so I came home and like right away, my dad just happened to get tickets. My dad and my uncle were given tickets to the World Series, so they invited me to go. And it was like right after I got back from this country, we go to City Field, the Mets were in the World Series that year. And we get there and it's exciting. I'm glad to see everybody again. But before the game started, you know, there's all the lights and everything. It was a little bit like sensory overload after being in a third world country. And so I just like got up and I took a walk. And while I was walking around the stadium, the game was about to start. And so someone came out and sang the national anthem. And me, like I, I love and appreciate, I would say I appreciate our country, but I'm not like super patriotic. But when I like, heard the national anthem and I thought for a minute about our country and I thought about that girl and the things here I will never have to worry about that other people in the world actually do have to worry about on a regular basis, I, I literally just started to cry because I was so grateful 
for where I live. And what I realized there is that like my whole life, like all the good, the freedom, the comforts, the luxuries that we have here, they're just sent to spam. I just don't think about it. Until something radical happened to me, I was exposed to something radical that helped me actually stop and see. And so like my question for you is what is being sent to spam in your life? Like what's happening around you that is good that you're just not registering because the tree is more obvious than the gorilla in the trees. Just a few weeks ago, when we were getting ready for this series, it was a Saturday, I was at my daughter's softball game. Whenever we're getting ready for a series, it's always like in the back of my mind and it was cold. I wasn't really super excited to be out there. It was windy, it just stopped raining and I just didn't want to be outside, but I was trying to be supportive. And so my son is like, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. And I was like, great. So we get up and we walk to the bathroom. We were at Tanner Park. And it's cold and I want to like get him there and then like get back. So I go back to my seat and just, you know, be miserable and cheer for my daughter. And as we're walking, we go to the bathroom and we come back and he like sees these big empty bleachers and he just starts to like climb them and he gets to the top. You know, and all I'm thinking is like, come on, let's go, like, stop. I don't want to sit here and watch you like climb on the bleachers. We just got to get back to the seats, you know, and I'm like, like just, it's an inconvenience for me. And because this just happened to be on my mind, I stopped and I looked at him and I watched him get to the very top of the bleachers and he's seven years old. He just stood up there like this at the top, (laughs) like he had just climbed a mountain. And I looked like at the satisfaction in his eyes and stopped and realized like what a privilege it is to watch him like develop right in front of me. I remember feeling like that when I was seven. And yet I'm missing it because come on, like we gotta go. Because I'm not stopping to intentionally see the good. And so it's getting sent to spam. And and that's the kind of stuff that will erode the quality of your relationships. If you're a parent, you'll miss things. If you're in a relationship, if you're a significant other, you'll miss the things that he's doing, that she's doing. You'll miss it. Unless you stop to see it, to check the spam folder. Uh, In a few weeks, it's going to be Thanksgiving, right? And so what if like we did some actual preparation for Thanksgiving? What if you took a few minutes this week, this week, before, a week before Thanksgiving, ahead of time, took a few minutes, and what if you just stopped and thought about every person that was going to be there? And what if maybe it's in, on a pad, or on your notes app, or whatever. You just wrote their name, and you stopped, and you thought about one good thing about them. Something you appreciate about them. Just simply to not think about the inconvenience that they might be, or the last like weird conversation you had, or how maybe you're dreading seeing certain people, and you just like dug for the good and brought it to your mind. I think you'd be amazed to see that it's there. It's there. You just have to look for it. And you have to think about what you think about. If we do things like this intentionally, eventually we'll see them automatically. If we do these things intentionally, we won't miss them. I'm gonna ask the band to come back up here. Uh, but here's the, the picture I want to leave you with. You know, um, if, I'm, if I'm being totally honest with you, this topic of gratitude, like seeing the good, it is way easier for me to talk about than it actually is to practice. I don't know why, it's just something that I struggle with. Uh, I like to improve things. I like to see potential in things. And so I tend to just focus on the negative. 
And I don't have to reach very far back to look for an example. In fact, like just last week, we were in here kicking off a series on gratitude. And for me, like this is, this is my part, right? Like this is the part that I'm responsible for, I've gotta teach, and whenever I'm doing that, I try to make my point clear. And sometimes I walk off the stage, off the platform, feeling like, okay, what I wanted to say came out. And other times I'm like, I don't know if it got across. And last week was one of those weeks, right? I like walked off the platform, I went to my seat, and I'm just sitting there like, ah. after one of the services, like, I don't think it actually got out there. And I'm like just dwelling and like thinking and sitting in the negative. And I just stopped like for a minute and looked around the room on this property that's being like totally transformed. This room filled with people some people who have found a home in church for the first time in their lives. Some for the first time in years. I've seen people that I've gotten to know and love. And, and like I stopped for a second, looked around and realized I'm missing it. I'm missing it. Because I'm seeing the lack. I'm seeing the failure. I'm seeing... It's not quite right. And what we don't see intentionally, we tend to miss completely. And so today, this week, before you complain about something, before you beat yourself up, before you rain on your own parade, stop and take a minute to make sure there's not something that you're missing.